we usually talk about, you know, this will pass. But what you might not realize is what you want to pass might actually be your greatest blessing. It might actually have the blessing in it at that moment. How many youth come to us and say, you know, what's going on in Gaza? I feel terrible. Me sitting here. You know, and then when you see on the television, women and children dying and you just beyond their control and it's just it's totally oppressive. It's, it just really makes you think and ask yourself, what am I doing? Am I sitting here desiring convenience? Mm -hmm. It's like sadaqah times 100. In that sadaqah, you have something in your hand, you give it, that's already a big deal because you watch it leave, but then you trust Allah that it comes back. Okay, but you know that your paycheck's coming next month, right? So you have like sort of a hope that it's going to be regenerated. Your life, it's a big deal. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Welcome back to Quran 30 for 30. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. As we are getting started, inshallah ta'ala, just to remind you, first and foremost, to please donate to Yaqeen. We're, as we're getting into Ramadan, I hope that you're already seeing the way that we have tried to meet the needs of the time with the resources with the night time that will benefit people and that will increase them and how vital this all is to our ummah and to humanity as a whole. So we need you from now, inshallah ta'ala, to donate. You can automate a donation every day of Ramadan. Whatever it is that you do, inshallah ta'ala, we need your support, bidnanai ta'ala, especially those of you who supported us in previous years. All I ask of you, inshallah ta'ala, is that you match your donation or increase it, bidnanai ta'ala. So please do go ahead and click that link, inshallah ta'ala. And also you can download the Quran 30 for 30 ebook where Sheikh Ismail has brilliantly compiled all of the previous seasons of Quran 30 for 30 into a book that you can follow along with, inshallah. So read it before each juz so that you are tracking, inshallah ta'ala, the context of the juz as we get into the specifics of each one of those ajza. So again, donate, download, inshallah ta'ala, and I hope you're enjoying all of the content. And with that, uh, I am seated between two yaqeen stars, alhamdulillah, I mean. Uh, Iman Cave and Imam Abdullah Live, right? That's the scenario. <laughs> so, <sorry. laughs> it's, uh, yeah, right. uh, Iman Cave, <laughs> Imam Tom Live. Right. I got like check notes, man. How do I pronounce your last name, man? It's, uh, it shifts every week. What is it? it, it? <laughs> Fakini. <Fakeen. laughs> Imam Tom Fakini, alhamdulillah. I mean, uh, Sheikh Tom, how's it going? Alhamdulillah, good. How are you? Alhamdulillah, good. Sheikh Tom, how do you pronounce it with the accent? Fakini. Fakini. Yeah, like, Fakini. Yeah. Like well, first of all, you put your fingers together. Like I was this. in Master Fingers. Yeah, yeah. And he's like, Fakini. It's like Shadda on the K. Hey, <laughs> yeah. Nice, nice, nice. Okay. It's Italian, right? Yes. Mashallah. But actually, the actual word comes from Arabic. Mm. It entered into the Italian language. Ah, yeah, okay. interesting. Yeah. Nice. So Fakino is somebody who, like, like a porter, someone who carries people's bags. But okay. the actual word from, comes from Fakih. Ah, yeah. Faqih. Yeah. So it was meant to be a part it's of it. Well, it was crazy because I found I didn't find out the history of the name until I started doing some family research when I was in Medina. Um, and I was already studying in the faculty of Sharia. And then I told my dad and he like couldn't believe it. He's like, so you're saying we were all Muslims? Slow down, dad. No, 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 that's not what I'm saying. But, but if you want to believe yeah, it. I was going to say, I'm not saying don't close the door. But maybe, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So may Allah allow me to live up to it and all of us to live up to our names. Amen. Allah, you got a It's wonderful to have you here, Sheikh Abdullah, of course. It's wonderful to have you as always. Um, and, you know, Sheikh Abdullah is making the kufiya look, uh, mashallah, nice and small, you know. <laughs> uh, we couldn't find <laughs> one of size, man. It's just not going to work, you know. So. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Um, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept both of you and all of, of course, our work and uh, to forgive us for our shortcomings. Allahumma ameen. So before we get started, of course, we have trivia every single day in Ramadan. We're going to be doing this, inshallah ta'ala, for every juz. And a reminder, inshallah ta'ala, to please go ahead and answer in the comments below every single day. And we're going to be tracking, inshallah ta'ala. So the question for today, before I get started with my ayat, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the first juz, Adam min rabbihi karimat, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala received some words from Adam alayhi salam, what were those words? What were the words that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala received from Adam alayhi salam in the first juz? So go ahead and answer in the comments below. And bismillah, let's get started. Alhamdulillah, wa Once again, so we're still in Surah Al-Baqarah and there are two things deeply related to Qadr that I want to speak about inshallah ta'ala, to divine decree, which is of course the theme of the Ramadan series. It's very interesting. Verse 216, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, alaykum al-qital wa huwa kurhun lakum wa asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum wa asa an tuhibbu shay'an Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, fighting has been made obligatory upon you, O believers, even though you hate it. 
And perhaps you dislike something which is good for you and like something which is actually bad for you. So you might hate something that is actually better for you and you might want something or like something or love something uh, which is actually worse for you, which is actually bad for you. And Allah knows and you do not know. So basically default back to the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't know, that's why you are experiencing in a certain way. Now, of course, this is referring to, as the ulama mentioned, the battle of Badr, uh, the first time that the Muslims are to take arms against those who have persecuted them and driven them out. And this is, of course, early Medina. And this is what Al-Baqarah is referring to. But that's not what I want to focus on. The only other time Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this language in the Quran is verse 19 of Surah An-Nisa. And it's in regards to divorce. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that, you know, if a person is going to reach a point in which they have sort of met the end of their marriage, right? And they're running out of the quote unquote, you know, uh, love bank inside of them for their spouse. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَعَسَىٰ أَن تَكْرَهُ شَيْئًا وَيَجْعَلُ اللَّهُ فِيهِ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا If you despise them, if you come to a place of disliking them, you may hate something which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually puts great blessing in. And so you can already see the connection between the two. That you might love something that is bad for you, you might hate something that is good for you. And in Surah Nisa, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that which you actually hate might have a lot of blessing in it. So it's not even look at what you don't like uh, and look at what you like, it is what you don't like actually be, may be, uh, you know, the main source of blessing for you and what you will eventually come to love. Now, here's what I want to focus on, bidna Allah ta'ala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a connection between what you naturally hate and what you naturally love with what you know and you don't know. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us in these verses that the reason why you are experiencing what you are experiencing, the way you are experiencing it is because you don't know what is really behind it. So, you know, usually we talk about, look, in the matter of Surah Yusra, with hardship comes ease, there is light at the end of the tunnel. But what you're not realizing is there may be light in the moment that you are in. You simply can't see it. We usually talk about, you know, this will pass. But what you might not realize is what you want to pass might actually be your greatest blessing. It might actually have the blessing in it at that moment. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also, as the ulama is saying, making an excuse for us as human beings and saying that the reason why you cannot appreciate this is because you don't know what's actually happening. And so, of course, you're experiencing this particular moment, this particular episode of your life in this way because you don't know any better. But you do know al alim you do know the one who knows all. And that should give you comfort, mm -hmm. right? Knowing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows should give you comfort. And I'll end with this inshallah ta'ala, and then I want Shaykh Abdullah, of course, to reflect and Imam Tom. It's really beautiful because the angels asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, atajadu fiha man yufsidu fiha wa yasfiku dima. Right? When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala announces the very creation of Adam <laughs> alayhi salam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, are you going to place as a khalifa on this earth people that will or, or the descendants of whom will spread corruption, spill blood. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. Of course you're going to react that way, O angels, but I know that which you don't know. <laughs> so there is your out. And for us as human beings, Allah knows and we don't know. There is our out. But do you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and submit to his knowledge and his wisdom in the process? And if you do, then there is a sweetness in that, even if there isn't a sweetness in the particular episode or moment that you are facing. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us the sweetness of yaqeen, mm -hmm. certainty in knowing Allah and knowing that Allah knows and knowing that Allah knows and plans with wisdom and executes in ways that are best for us at the end of the day, so long as we remain submissive to him and seeking his pleasure. Allahumma ameen. Yeah. So ta'ala, Shaykh Abdullah, I'll pass it off to you. I just want to say, you know, it's probably an elephant in the room who said the sweetness of yaqeen. I mean, he means the sweetness of the certainty, but also even as Yaqeen is a family, I got to say, man, I love you for the sake of Allah, bro, really. Oh, Seriously. Man, mashallah. Seriously. Mashallah. And the brothers, mashallah, it's the family. I mean, Imam Tom coming through at the moment, you know, what, what's going on with our brothers and sisters in Gaza. Just to remind all of us to stick together as Muslims and to work together for a great cause because it will go well beyond you on that day when you really need it, you know. So I'm really thankful for all of you, mashallah. I'm thankful for your viewers for tuning in and just finding a way to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the fact that you're searching is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves and you're working hard 
is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves. Just want to mention that, inshallah ta'ala. Barakallah fikum. Barakallah fikum. I love you and elevate you. I mean, I mean, all of us, all of us, all of us. I want to talk about how he was mentioning, you know, servitude and worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala voluntarily and recognizing that there are things that you don't know, but you still submit to him and kind of looking, having introspection and saying, you know, being optimistic as a prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, can he say, he said, you're a jibbin in fa'al. You know, I love optimism, something that amazes him that he loves. <clears throat> there are those that don't take time to think about that, rather they want something hurriedly. They want something immediate. They're not willing to wait. They're not willing to look at the bright side of things. Rather, they want something that d is dependent on their intellect and their desires, their shahwat, their desires. Therefore, they may do things that are not befitting to them in this life and definitely in the next to where they would quote unquote, as was mentioned or is known as to sell out. They'll sell out their people. They'll sell out their religion for something that is temporary, some temporary, worldly, tangible gain. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the chapter of Baqarah verses number 174, particularly 175, he speaks about those that conceal the book revealed by Allah and sell it away for a trifling gain. That they, you know, you know they, they, they sell the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or that which calls to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for something more that they desire. Now when looking at the next verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ اشْتَرَوُوا الضَّلَالَةَ بِالْهُدَىٰ وَالْعَذَابَ بِالْمَغْفِرَةِ فَمَا أَصْبَرَهُمْ عَلَى النَّارِ SubhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking about those people that conceal anything from the book revealed by Allah and sell it away for a trifling gain or merely, merely fill, filling their bellies. Those types of people, types of people, he says, those are the ones who brought error in exchange for true guidance. اِشْتَرَوُوا الضَّلَالَةَ بِالْهُدَىٰ And what's so interesting here, is that Allah uses the word ishtira. You'll find this word ishtira, yani it is tabadul, that they purchased. In Arabic, to buy something, it is ishtira, when you buy something. So you are giving something in exchange for something else. So Allah is saying here, ishtira wa dalalata bil huda. They purchased error in exchange for guidance. Let's just stop and think about that. How many times do we as Muslims, as human beings, know what's right and we choose what's wrong in exchange for what's right. We choose what's wrong in exchange for what is right. The one that is concerned looks at what motivated me to choose that over that. What motivated me to choose hanging out and watching television and watching things that are not befitting to me over praying? What, what was inside of me that made me choose to lie as opposed to telling the truth? Was it fear? Was it ultimately a desire? Was it something that was shah, some type of shahwa? And wanting and desiring the tangibilities of this earth is exactly that, where you take in exchange for guidance or in exchange for the elements of guidance or that which nourishes your soul, guidance just for nourishing yourself temporarily. And that's the ishtira, the tabadul, the, in exchange for it. And that's what's so beautiful here. And dalala can either mean misguidance in general, but it can be being lost or it can be taking the wrong way. So when we talk about those that have the dalala, it is though they are literally lost because they are choosing their desires, worldly gain, money, fame, whatever it is, in exchange for humility, in exchange for being impoverished voluntarily to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْعَذَابَ بِالْمَغْفِرَةِ so, so they purchased error in exchange for guidance and chastisement in exchange for forgiveness. So Allah is saying, عَذَابَ Bil maghfira, because those that purchased the dalala, that purchased the misguidance in exchange for guidance, the guidance is a means for forgiveness. When one finds guidance or one seeks guidance, this is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgive, will forgive you because you are making the effort. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when we recite Surah Al-Fatiha, when we ask us, إِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ as many scholars would say, which is very, very beautiful, إِهْدِنَا إِلَى الصِّرَاطِ وَفِي الصِّرَاطِ Guide us to the straight path, and while we are in it, as Muslims, for example, we still choose to stay on it. I'm still praying five times a day to the best of my ability. I'm still being honest. I'm still trying to understand my faith. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says at the very end, فَمَا أَصْبَرَهُمْ عَلَى النَّارِ And then he says, how patient are they in enduring the fire? Which is very interesting. Mentioning these types of people, that they have patience with the fire. They are content 
being in this state of following their desires. And sigat ta'ajub, as the scholars would call it, it is, a, it is an uslub, or it is a way, a manner of speaking that shows amazement. How can these people be patient on the hellfire? How can these people be patient with following their desires and they know where it will ultimately go? That is why, in conclusion, it is important for the Muslim, the human being in general, and the Muslim in specific, to always be attentive. And this, one of the strongest ways of being attentive is knowing the names and attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pondering over them, and mentioning dhikrullah subhanahu wa ta'ala with your tongue and with your limbs. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those that are patient with his qadr, his predestination, Amen. and fearing the fire. Barakallahu feekum. Sheikh Tom. Uh, Surah Al-Baqarah amazes me and one of the things that amazes me that I discussed last year on this program was the sort of interplay between identity versus principle uh, and how this is one of the main mistakes that Bani Israel made that they put all their chips into uh, the bucket of identity. And I was explaining this sort of thing to the middle schoolers that I teach uh, a week or two ago and I was saying imagine if you're the only child right and you put all of your self-value in the fact that you're the only child. What's gonna happen when your parents have another kid? <laughs> you're going to reject that other child. This is very much the situation of Bene Israel and also the Christians after them. And this is one of the main themes that runs through Surah Al-Baqarah and the warning that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has for our ummah to not have a relationship that's limited to just identity, but one that rather is attuned to principle and choice, meaning uh, let's obey Allah's guidance wherever we find it as it mm -hmm. comes down, which is why when the second Jew starts and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts talking about the change of the Qibla, that's a symbol of that exact relationship because mm -hmm. the Muslims began praying towards, you know, we, we know that when they were in Mecca, they were able to hit both the Kaaba and then uh, Masjid al-Aqsa, but then when they moved after the Hijrah, they had to make a choice between the two. So they're first praying towards Masjid al-Aqsa and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this part of the Quran finally reveals, okay, you are allowed to now turn towards the Kaaba and take that as your Qibla. So this symbolizes that the Muslim Ummah is supposed to di differentiate ourselves from the previous Ummah that came before by always being responsive to Allah's command and the things that he's ordering, as opposed to being just like, we're the ones that received revelation, we're saved no matter what we do, this is our identity, no one can touch us, we're better than everybody else, ahibba'Allah. Mm. No, 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 it's about being responsive. So Allah's, in that case, Allah's sending down guidance in real time, and the Muslims are supposed to be following it in real time and obeying in real time. And so it, it really fascinates me how the change of the Qibla is a, is a symbol of that. Um, the second point for this part of the Jews that, that fascinates me is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about sort of a paradigm of how prophets uh, interact with their communities. And this is, has secondary benefits for everybody who's a da'i because obviously, you know, you interact with the community in a similar station or in a similar way. And the ingredients of the prophetic method, they don't leave behind uh, tezkiyah. They actually in structurally incorporate tezkiyah into the thing. It's not a, a bias towards just information or cognitive mm -hmm. ability. It's not just all up in your head. Mm -hmm. It's also about your heart. And so when Allah says, كَمَا أَرْسَلْنَا فِيكُمْ رَسُولًا مِنْكُمْ يَتْسُ عَلَيْكُمْ آيَاتِنَا وَيُزَكِّيكُمْ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمُ الْكِتَابُ وَالْحِكْمَةِ وَيُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ there's a lot of lessons in that. One of them is that, first of all, our dependence upon the revelation, because Allah says at the end of the ayah, we're teaching you things that you didn't know. Mm -hmm. And I think the implication is that you couldn't have figured them out, right, without us informing you. And there's other ayats in the Quran that bear witness to that as well. But then also the fact that this is not just about teaching information. And unfortunately, us in the West, many of our Islamic institutions of learning, we've kind of, you know, we're moving in the ether around us and we think that it's just about information. It's not. It's also ethical information, ethical knowledge, that you have to put that ethical dimension into everything that you learn. Mm -hmm. Because as we know, if you subtract it or leave it behind, what you know can actually be used against you on the Day of Judgment, right? It can be a hujjah against you and not just a hujjah for you. So we have to make sure that we bring along the ethical component with us. And then my last reflection for, for this particular Jews has to do with martyrdom. This is a part of the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the martyrs. And obviously with all of us seeing what's going on in Gaza, this is something that's very, very timely and important. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, mm -hmm. That these are people who have actually completely witnessed Allah's true promise. 
that it's like sadaqah times 100. In that sadaqah, you have something in your hand, you give it, that's already a big deal because you watch it leave, but then you trust the law that it comes back. Okay, but you know that your paycheck's coming next month, right? So you have like sort of a hope that it's going to be regenerated. Your life, it's a big deal <laughs> to, to sacrifice your life or to be willing to bear witness to Allah's promise in that sort of way. Whereas you give up your life and there's only one of those, right? So then to trust Allah so much that you believe so firmly that it's going to be given back to you, that you, it's, it's a form of witnessing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise and really, truly living, um, you know, as if you're, you're witnessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's promise folding, unfolding in front of you. Those who responded to their, their Lord, right? So that's even a wasf, a description of the shuhada of the martyrs. It's really powerful, you know, subhanAllah, it's something I just thought of when, when uh, you're talking about life after death. You got to think about like the mindset. These people went from having idols and no sense of theology, mm. no sense of creed, no sense of resurrection at all to this state. You have the mushrikeen, the disbelievers in Mecca that are doubting the very existence of life after death. Mm. And then you have the believers that are being put to ease with not just life after death, but there's a better life after death mm -hmm. than this one. Mm -hmm. And in fact, those that you have seen physically torn to pieces. Because Quraysh did not just used to kill, they mutilated. Mm -hmm. And this was one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ mentioned of their blameworthy traits. You know, the Arabs, even before Islam, used to take pride in certain ethical standards, but it shows you without revelation how quickly they can violate those ethical standards when they're no longer convenient to them, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So now that it was, you know, no longer convenient to them to maintain any ethical standards because they'd kind of given up the, the right to a claim, right, of, of being people of chivalry. Now they are cutting off people's noses, mm. chewing out livers, right, mutilating, crucifying the Muslims who did nothing, right, except for believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and respond to the call of Allah. And they're doing that and they don't believe in life after death. So they don't believe in accountability for themselves. And they don't really fear their bones being brought back, right? As, as they're so relegated to like the material. Whereas the believers are being told, look, you see Hamza radiallahu anhu over there and you see the way that he looks. He is Sayyid al-Shuhada. Mm -hmm. He is the master of the martyrs. Um, you know, Jabir ibn Abdullah, one of my favorite stories, uh, Jabir ibn Abdullah ibn Haram radiallahu anhuma, when uh, Jabir is told by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi you know, why do I see you like this? Uh, why am I, why do I see you broken? Literally the Prophet sallallahu said, you're so broken. Mm -hmm. And he told them, you know, my father and the situation, you know, my father was martyred in Uhud, the situation, and the Prophet sallallahu mentions to him that don't you know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he speaks to his creation, the believers, he speaks to them from behind a veil, but he spoke to your father without a veil. Mm -hmm. Like how elevated he is. Abdullah ibn Haram was mutilated. And I think with everything happening at Gaza right now, because we're seeing images of mutilation, literally mutilation, the most horrific scenes of bodies being torn about, you know, torn apart. And still, we take comfort in resurrection because of the accountability of the criminals and of the life that we know after death uh, for our brothers and sisters. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept Amen. from them and forgive us. Uh, for our shortcomings and accept Amen. us as well. Well, man. Amen. 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 Yeah, and that's uh, you know when you talked about convenience, and you mentioned uh, which is in very very mashallah eloquent words, Allah is revealing in real time. So we have to they had to respond in real time, particularly with the qibla. I mean, if we look at our situation as well, when something is revealed to you that you didn't know from before, even though the Sharia is there, but the the the, the the legislative body of Islam, the system of Islam is there. But at your particular time, something's revealed to you. You know, you really have to choose between the convenience and the inconvenience and be comfortable with inconvenience and uncertainty. And that is what increase, establishes for some and increases for others their faith. Mm. Because if not, you can sell out. And literally this term sell out is very interesting. Mm -hmm. We're talking about ishtira, you know, you purchase the, the, the dolala or you purchase, you know, this life or the afterlife and the concept of the shaheed. I mean, it's exactly that because it's something that is intangible, something that is beyond you to where your very existence is insignificant. And, you know, 
it, it's not just because I'm aggressive, you know, I may get that level of shuhada. It's, mm. it's, if you are oppressed, yes, inshallah ta'ala, but that connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to where you want to be with him. And if Allah chooses to take you in whichever way that is an oppressive way, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that there's five, and he mentioned some of them are the, the shuhada al gharik wa sahib al hadam, the one that, you know, a building falls on him, or the one that drowns, or the one that is burned. But the concept of being willing to leave this earth for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and being, as you mentioned, principled, dying on principles, that is what makes all of our heroes, heroes from Malcolm onward, from the companions, they died on principle. Like, and we have to ask ourselves that question really right now. I mean, we know, mashallah, our brothers and sisters, how many youth come to us and say, you know, what's going on in Gaza? I feel terrible, me sitting here. You know, and then when you see on the television, women and children dying, and you're just beyond their control, and it's just it's totally oppressive. It's, it just really makes you think and ask yourself, what am I doing? Am I sitting here desiring convenience? Mm -hmm. That's why the concept of Islam, subhanAllah, the concept of martyrdom and the concept of, you know, really staying in touch with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at all times, as you mentioned, the ethical portion of it, you can have the knowledge in your head, but if there is no ethical part to where you're principled on something transcendent, you're principled on something spiritual, for lack of better words, your foundation can be shaky to where when these times of inconvenience come to you, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to allow us to make the right choices and Amen. to die upon those principles. Amen based on those choices, inshallah. Which is why, you know, subhanAllah, towards the end of the Jews, Allah Azza wa brings up the story of Saul, right? He brings mm -hmm. up the, the, the story of the army. Mm -hmm. And what does he do? He, he's marching with the army, everybody's thirsty, uh -huh. and he has them make a choice. Yeah. He wants to see who's going to adhere to principle so. and who's going to not be able to sacrifice, right? Mm -hmm. right? It's like the way to Jannah is filled with these inconvenient things. Mm -hmm. And so then... It, with a materialist calculus, it doesn't make any sense. You're about to go into battle. You want as many people as possible. But he understood that it's much more important to have a small band of people who are principled than it is to have as many as you possibly can. And this one over here is following, you know, he wants a position and this one over here is, is going for, you know, you're, yeah. it, that's a path to failure. In Allah hashtara. So it's interesting. That's the verse I was trying to remember. Yeah, yeah, no. I was trying to remember this verse. Just like, okay, go ahead. Bismillah. Go ahead. You go. Right? Allah mentions all these people who purchase misguidance with guidance, who purchase punishment with forgiveness. But what does Allah say? Allah has purchased from the believers. Their selves and their wealth because they have Jannah. The response, the reward is going to be Jannah. So... If that's what you're looking for, Allah has already purchased yourselves and Allah has purchased your wealth. It's probably it's like interesting, you know, and, and I think it's it's an important note because uh, they obviously assign to us like this death cult, right? Like mm -hmm. that Muslims are a death cult, Muslims are a death cult. It's like, well, look, you know, if there, there's a saying that if you haven't found something that you're willing to die for, then you haven't found the purpose to live, mm -hmm. right? And that's not a Muslim saying. I don't even remember who said it, to be honest with you. but you can find in the history of people that were dedicated to any of their causes that that cause transcended their very existence. Wow. And That's once it did, then it wasn't about comfort anymore. It was about clarity and it was about purpose and it was about worship. It was about servitude. It was about, you know, the cause before all else. And for us, what greater cause than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself? Fi <laughs> Allah. Allah himself, right? that um, we found something in our lives that transcends life in the night time. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put that sincerely in our hearts. Ameen. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate us with it. Allahumma ameen. ameen. Any uh, 20 second thoughts? No. That's it. Jazakum Allah khair. It was wonderful to have you. And uh, Shaykh Tan, we look forward to continuing to benefit from you. And Jazakum Allah khair unto you both. I love you both for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For the beautiful, you know, shows that you have ongoing and the beautiful work that you're doing as well uh, with Yaqeen. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you both and elevate you. To our viewers, inshallah, we'll see you all tomorrow. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.